Hello, everyone. I am Rahul Gosain. And I'm Rohit Gosain. And we are Oncology Brothers. A lot of data was presented at the World Conference on Lung Cancer in Singapore. But today we'll focus on four practice informing studies that should be on your radar as a medical oncologist. To start, we'll discuss Flora 2, then looking at the second line treatment options for mutated EGFR patients. Of course, we'll touch on MARS 2 for mesothelioma, and to close, we'll focus on Evoke 2 with potential new frontline treatment options in non small cell lung cancer. To walk us through these critical studies, we're joined by none other than Dr. Stephen Liu from Lombardi Cancer Center. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Rohit Rahul. Uh, pleasure to talk about these and, and uh, have a, a little bit of discussion on the perspectives. Stephen, welcome. We have a lot of exciting studies to cover. Can we first start off with Flora 2? Looking at the role of Osimertinib, which we are already aware about how to utilize it is an individual setting, but now this is to combine chemotherapy with osimertinib in metastatic non-small cell lung cancer patients with common EGFR mutations. If you don't mind talking about this study and going about the study design and followed by study results, please. Yeah, happy to. Uh, this is a randomized phase three trial for patients with EGFR mutant lung cancer. We're talking about the common sensitizing mutations. That would be exon 19 deletion, exon 21 L858R. And I think that thinking about this study, you know, we know that osimertinib or a third gen EGFR kinase inhibitors are preferred standard of care in the frontline setting has been for quite some time. But despite the fact that this is a, an effective agent, that it is well tolerated, that it is the best that we have, the outcomes leave a lot to be desired. When we saw those first studies, uh, you know, now five years ago, uh, median progression-free survival of almost 19 months was so much better than what we'd had before. But I think the three of us agree when we have a patient diagnosed with EGFR mutant lung cancer and we expect a PFS of a year and a half, that is not long enough. And over the past couple of years, we've seen other frontline TKIs and other targets like ROS1, like RET, like ALK really eclipse EGFR. EGFR has been a little static. We need something new. We need something better. What is there? Well, you know, several years ago, we saw two large studies, one NEJ009, a Japanese study, one from Tata Memorial, looking at the addition of cytotoxic chemotherapy, platinum pemetrexin, to frontline EGFR kinase inhibitors. Now, those were first generation inhibitors, specifically gefitinib. And what they showed was when you add chemotherapy to a TKI, you increase toxicity, no surprise. You increase response rate and progression-free survival, also no surprise when you're adding active drugs. What was surprising was that you significantly improved survival. And that was intriguing. And the question is, can you do the same thing with a third generation inhibitor? Now, while this study was uh, going on, we saw a couple other things emerge that might color our interpretation. One, the NEJ009 study, the Japanese study that showed chemotherapy improved survival with gefitinib, more follow-up, uh, that study actually lost significance for survival. And two, the AGAIN study done by the, the JCONC group, also in Japan, looked at just a limited run of chemotherapy. You know, and their hypothesis here, if we think about the science, say, well, if there are clones at the beginning that are destined to cause resistance to osimertinib, can we eliminate them now and reap the benefits later? Is everything manifest destiny? Are we uh, already seeing the eventual resistant clones present, can we target those with chemotherapy and then just let osimertinib keep working for years on end? And we saw that a limited course of chemotherapy really did not impact overall survival. And the benefit of progression-free survival was transient, really suggesting that's not how it works and it really is constant suppression. So with all that as prelude, we see Flora 2. Flora 2, well-designed study, large trial, randomized phase three. Now they stratified patients by race, by EGFR mutation, not mutation type whether it was central or local, and by performance status. Not the ones I would have chosen, but the, the cohorts did seem pretty balanced at the end. And patients are randomized to a standard arm of osimertinib alone or an experimental arm of osimertinib plus chemotherapy. That chemotherapy, platinum plus pemetrexid induction, followed by maintenance, though you could stop the maintenance um, in the event of toxicity or intolerability and continue the TKI. In the control arm of osimertinib, there was not a mandated crossover. And so we're not really comparing concurrent versus sequential. We're comparing an upfront strategy of combined chemotherapy and targeted therapy versus upfront with targeted therapy. The primary endpoint here is progression-free survival. And you know, between us, I don't know that that's the best endpoint here. Um, 
What we saw was that when you add chemotherapy, you're adding active drugs, drugs that we know work well in this cancer subtype, you increase response rate a little bit. Not a surprise. You also significantly improve progression-free survival. That was the primary endpoint of this study. Now, if we go by blinded independent review versus investigator, the numbers are a little bit different. The primary endpoint was actually investigator assessed, and there the median progression-free survival was a little over 16 months, a little under what we saw in flora. So the control arm underperformed a little bit, but even with the blinded independent review, the hazard ratios were the same. Really what we saw was about an eight to nine month improvement in progression-free survival, hazard ratio around 0.6. That was the same for both arms. So that is a pretty significant improvement in progression-free survival. The trade-off is toxicity. We saw a lot of it, right? and really a lot of grade three toxicities. They're the toxicities that we expect, myelosuppression, nausea, vomiting. Overall survival is very immature at this point, but as of right now, there's not a clear survival benefit. Those curves overlap. Too early to tell, right? Fortunately, too early to tell. But it leaves us with the question. When we add chemotherapy, we significantly improve progression-free survival. The cancer stays under control for longer, but at what cost? Not so much talking about financial cost, though it is a consideration. I'm talking about the cost of toxicity and, importantly, on quality of life. For some people, it will absolutely be worth it. For others, it won't. Um, I think that we'll be able to have those more meaningful discussions when we know what the impact on survival is. And maybe when I can better tell who gets most of the benefit based on biomarkers, commutations, CTD analysis, my sense is that we're just scratching the surface. I think this is an option. This is a strategy. And there are certain instances where it makes sense, but I do not think this is right for everybody. You brought up some critical points, not right for everybody, but we did see that, again, just PFS, patients with CNS or maybe heavy tumor burden as a uh, surrogate might benefit. But again, having that conversation with the patient is so important. You're right. The, the subset of patients that had baseline brain metastases, that has a ratio of progression-free survival seemed to be a little bit better. Now, is that because platinum pemetrexid has some CNS efficacy? Quite possibly. But does that impact long-term outcomes? Does it just mean that a patient received stereotactic radio surgery, one dose, and, and does that really impact uh, the, the the whole perspective of everything? We don't know. It's all the details that matter. So that subset did seem to do a little bit better with the addition of chemotherapy, um, but we don't know if that translates into improved long-term outcomes yet. Absolutely. Stephen, thank you for covering that. And before we move on, Again, it is so critical to recognize the importance of NGS testing so that we can have these discussions with our patients. And this is not only important in metastatic disease, but now also in early stage where we're seeing a bigger and bigger role for adjuvant or periop chemotherapy based on neuroapprovals. And yeah. even at this uh, conference, there was a subgroup analysis from Aegean trial where patients who had EGFR mutation got exposed to periop uh, chemoimmunotherapy, and they did not have any benefit. So again, testing and looking for these actionable mutation in early and metastatic setting is very important. You're absolutely right. That That's a huge, important message. You know, these really are different diseases, and we are handicapping ourselves if we don't have that information. Without the right biomarker information, we cannot make the right decisions. None of us can. We're just guessing, and we have to do better than that. So, you know, our jobs are already hard enough. We're going to make it easy. Got to have that biomarker information. It's a different disease, totally different approach. So moving right along, second line treatment options here with patients with EGFR mutation is very limited. And once you've progressed on osimertinib or maybe some selected few with osimertinib and chemo, we don't have much. Dr. Liu, your thoughts on Chris Hallis too? So Chrysalis 2 is a study looking at the EGFR met by a specific antibody, amivantamab. Now, we're pretty familiar with this agent. It's approved um, for EGFR exon 20 insertion lung cancer. It's being studied in a couple different uh, settings, and here we see it in the common um, and atypical EGFR mutations through the Chrysalis study, different cohorts. Now, when we combine it with lazertinib, I get a lot of questions about lazertinib. Lazertinib is another third-generation EGFR inhibitor currently approved in Korea Pretty similar, I think, in terms of efficacy. Not studied head-to-head, -head, but sort of the, the same types of metrics as other third-gen EGFR inhibitors. A little bit different in terms of side effects, though. A little bit less diarrhea, a little more paresthesias. Um, but I think that I would consider it similar to a third-gen EGFR inhibitor like osimertinib. Not the same, but similar. Here you're combining imivantamab with lazertinib and with chemotherapy. And so really a four-pronged approach. 
This is a relatively modest cohort here. We're seeing about a response rate of 50% clear activity, but there is toxicity as well. Amivantab is a little bit of a tougher schedule. We know that we give that medicine weekly for a month, and then every two weeks, we know the chemotherapy brings its own toxicities. But this is a, a what's appealing about this, it's an empiric strategy that sort of covers a lot of different possible mechanisms of resistance. When we think of how we battle TKI resistance, a lot of us will advocate for biopsy. We'll use that biopsy to profile this new evolved tumor. And if we see a hidden vulnerability, we'll attack it. Whether it's med amplification, a RET fusion, a new BRAF mutation, we'll adapt along with the cancer. The reality is that's kind of hard to do. And while a lot of us, especially in academia, will say we biopsy everybody, use that to inform <laughs> things, that's, that's not true, right? Um, if we look at the ELIO study, which our colleague, Dr. Zosha Petrovska, presented at ESMO last year, this was a study that was only designed to do biopsies. So you have patients receiving osimertinib, and they agree to have a biopsy at progression for profiling. So you have a patient that is motivated and agrees to be included. You have a, a site that's familiar with biopsies, an investigator that is invested in doing these biopsies, and it's paid for by the study. And even under those perfect, completely non-real world conditions, the rate of successful paired biopsy was 39%. So that's the best that we can do. Um, so if we say we biopsy 100% of patients, I got a bridge I can tell you right now. It's just not real. So we do the best that we can, but what we want is really an empiric strategy, something that's going to work for everybody. There's some appeal to having simplicity, and that's why chemotherapy is a good approach. Whether we should continue TKI or not, we don't know. That'll be the COMPEL study. Antibody drug conjugates like trope 2, like HER3 ADCs, those are appealing. And this strategy, where you have amivantamab that covers MET, which we know is common mediating resistance. You have lizardinib, so you retain that CNS activity and chemotherapy. This sort of four-pronged approach to really attack um, uh, resistant cancers is, is sort of naturally appealing. We're going to have more options. The hard part over the next year or two will be kind of a rank and file as to when to use what option. Amivantamab, as you mentioned, that it is approved for Exxon ETFR20 uh, mutation. Now, we are eagerly waiting for our line data for this drug. To get a little more comfortable in managing toxicity with this drug, we are already aware about the infusion reaction. Some particular clinical pearls with amivantamab for a community oncologist? Yeah, you know, I can tell you my approach. I, I've had a pretty good success with it. The infusion reaction is common. North of 70% of people will have an infusion reaction, but here's my approach. If we're using amivantamab, we're going to go forward to this. I tell people that we are going to see an infusion reaction. If we don't, that's okay. But I say usually we will, but that's okay. That's expected. And it's not an allergic reaction. It doesn't mean we can't continue this treatment. The way we give it is weekly for the first four weeks and then every two weeks. And that first dose, we split in the day one, day two. And that first day, that's when you see the infusion reaction. So my nurses know that we're going to see an infusion reaction here. They're standing at the ready. Um, they're ready to act. Patient is expecting it. When it occurs, we treat sort of standard with, with hypersensitivity reactions, but I don't re-challenge. We don't slow the rate down and keep going. We don't waste time with it. Had an infusion reaction. We watch, make sure you're okay. Once you're okay, we throw the bag away. Go home. Come back tomorrow. We'll finish off this first week. It'll never happen again. Right? And so as long as we expect it going forward, that to me is not the barrier. We expect it as soon as you get it, go home, we're done. We're going to pick it up tomorrow. It'll never happen again. To me, the, the main adverse event that I manage with amivantamib is rash. Right? And so we do see a lot of rash, which is an on-target, off-tumor effect, EGFR expressed on the skin. We're hitting that. And really rash, and that's true with all these Edison's, um, it's better to be proactive than reactive. And so when we think of different creams, emollients, protection from sun, it's huge. Um, all these things can, can help minimize that rash. Can't avoid it, um, but we can try to minimize it. Well, there's a lot happening in this space, and you've also briefly mentioned another ADC for HER3 based on her Athena trial. There's there's exciting data to come. All right, now let's focus on mesothelioma and one of the most talk studies from the conference, MARS2. Mars Dr. Luke, Stephen, your take here. Yeah, no, Rahul, this is, this is a tough one. None of us are surgeons, and you know, I want to be careful what we say. It. Start off by saying we're not surgeons, but this was an important study. This looked at patients with resectable mesothelioma. That means disease on one side of the tumor. The surgeon felt they could resect. Good performance status. All the patients start off receiving chemotherapy, and then if they're still resectable. They then go to surgery. Now, they're an extended pleurectomy decortication, or they just continue chemotherapy. If they go to surgery, after surgery, they complete chemotherapy, really asking the question, is this a surgical disease? Does surgical resection improve outcomes? And I think all of us were taught 
But that's the standard. If it's resectable, you resect. What we realize, though, as we get older, is that's not based on a lot of science. In fact, a lot of what we do is not based on science. It's based on dogma, it's based on logic, intuition, bias. Um, but for years, we thought that if we could resect it, we should resect it. The Mars 2 study, um, it's complicated to run a large surgical trial. There's a UK study led by Dr. Eric Lim um, from the Brompton. And what they showed was that the arm that got surgery, not only did they not do better than chemotherapy alone, they did worse. Now, it wasn't statistically detrimental, but the hazard ratio here was 1.28. That's the wrong side of one, and the curve split right away. There's some challenges here. Um, the staging, not necessarily this type of staging that everyone would do, PET scan, invasive mediastinal staging, wasn't required for everybody. Curves do cross over time. Um, there was some comment on sort of a, a, an unacceptably high 90-day mortality. You know, I, I don't know that those hold up, and other studies show similar numbers. Uh, while we look at subsequent care, while it's true that the con the control arm, the, the surgery arm, had a lower likelihood of getting immunotherapy later, which we know can improve survival, maybe that sways the survival, they weren't pre precluded from getting immunotherapy. It's not that they weren't allowed to get immunotherapy. It's simply that when you undergo a surgery like this, it takes a lot out of you. A lot happens afterwards, and you know, unfortunately, I suspect that many just weren't well enough to receive immunotherapy. Uh, I think that the conclusions here are that this surgery, which we had for years considered routine, should not be routine. And that now we question the role of surgery in this disease at all. It doesn't mean that there's not a role. I think there's still some room for more questions in the confines of, of a study. But I think the burden of proof really is to show that there is benefit on surgery. Are there certain cases where surgery uh, uh, can be beneficial? I think that we can't assume that that's the case. We need to show it because, um, you know, this study really suggests patients who had surgery that have done worse than those without it. And perhaps we should just move on to something like immunotherapy, which gives patients a better chance of long-term survival. So this was, was shocking. A few lessons here. One, first, I think this was an extremely well thought out, well designed trial. There's no perfect study. I thought it was extremely well presented. In fact, I think this is one of the best presentations I've ever I've ever heard. Um, I encourage others to listen to it when they can. But to me, an important lesson, not being a surgeon, an important lesson for me is that we have to challenge dogma. We have to challenge things that we've been uh, told are the right way to do it that don't yes. have any evidence, that aren't based in science. And we need to kind of go back say, hey, this thing that we've been doing forever, should we actually be doing it? I think our patients deserve that. Thanks so much for covering that. And I think you can't stress the importance of how important this study was. And you definitely covered it well because Dr. Lim did such a phenomenal job at stating what is very important here. Now, we as community oncologists, especially practicing in rural setting, we're always struggling to who to partner up with these patient population. This has to be the right volume setter, but now we are we won't have to dive in with these questions the data is going to put systemic treatment up at the forefront and give our patients a chance to stay at home and not go for surgery under these circumstances now back to the general variant of non-small cell lung cancer where we are relying on pdl1 score to dictate our treatment based on dr gabriel's presentation it is reassuring that chemo with immunotherapy is in fact the right approach for low pdl1 patient population on the other spectrum, where high PDL1, where we have been relying on single agent pembrolizumab, this study evoked two questions whether sasituzumab in addition to pembrolizumab potentially will have better outcome. Dr. Liu, can you please share your perspective on this data? Yeah, you know, I, I think that you might actually have more experience with this drug than me. And while we've used it in the <laughs> confines of studies, this is a drug that is approved for breast cancer, approved for bladder cancer. Sasituzumab govotecan, extremely fun drug to say, is an anti-trope 2 <laughs> antibody drug conjugate. So we've got a trope 2 antibody with a linker to an SN38 payload, which is sort of uh, the active component of a rinitecan. It's a very active drug. My colleagues in, in the breast division here at Georgetown uh, really speak favorably of this agent. So now we're looking at it in lung cancer. Now the Evoke 2 study is a phase two study and it's got four arms, but it's not randomized. Um, it's really looking at a couple of different strategies. One is adding sasituzumab govotecan to pembrolizumab, and they're looking at it in PDL1 high or PDL1 less than 50, which includes, by the way, low and negative that a 50-50 split, or a triplet combination of sastuzumab plus platinum, and that would be in squamous or non-squamous with pembrolizumab. Now, at this data, Byung Cho, Dr. Cho from uh, Yonsei University in Korea, presented cohort A and cohort B. So really just looking at sastuzumab, 
plus pembrolizumab. And in the PDL1 high, so pretty high response rate, 69%. Um, that's encouraging. And in the PDL1 less than 50, which was low or negative, we saw a response rate about 44%. Um, where do those fit in terms of our historic standards? Now, it's a little difficult to do cross-study comparisons. This is a relatively small study with about 30 patients in each arm. In addition, what do you compare it to? Are you comparing it to Pembro alone, which I would argue you're probably looking at like a keynote 042, and that's the case then in 042, you know, the response rate for PL1 high was lower than that, about, um, you know, 39%, and so this seems better than that. But Tastuzumab is, is kind of like a chemotherapy agent. And so if you're comparing it instead to Keynote 189, well, for Keynote 189, the response was 61%, which is pretty similar to 69%. So is this, is the comparative Pembro alone or is it Pembro plus chemotherapy? I think it's actually more Pembro plus chemotherapy. So that 69% response rate kind of on par with the 61% response rate. Now, where it gets harder is the PDL one less than 50% because there we saw the response rate was 44% with Tastuzumab, uh, Govotecan plus Pembrolizumab. Now, in Keynote 042, that response rate was 29% um, uh, for PDL1 low, uh, but Keynote 189 was more like 48%. So it depends on whether you're comparing it to chemo IO or IO alone. But to me, that's still not the right question. When we look at the addition of an antibody drug conjugate to immunotherapy, which we're seeing with this study, which we're also seeing with the Tropion lung studies with datapotamab, the appeal here is not response rate. Response rate is kind of an early signal of activity, and we take it. But you know, pushing the response rate up, even to 100%, that's not what we're after here. What we're after here is more durable survival. And if ADCs, antibody drug conjugates, are going to make an impact in our patients' lives and in our practice, in this setting, it's going to be survival. It's going to be durable survival. If there is a synergy between ADCs and checkpoint inhibitors, if it is, whether it's ADCC, whether it's antigen release, changing the spatial um, uh, dynamics through the bystander effect, whatever it's doing, if the ADCs are having some synergy with immunotherapy that can promote more immune-mediated responses that can hopefully translate to better landmark and long-term survival, that's the difference we can make. If we give 20 cytotoxics with Pembro, we can increase response rate. That's not our goal here. Our goal is to manage that, balance it with toxicity, and improve long-term survival. This study won't show us that. It shows us that it's feasible to do. Um, it was pretty well tolerated, and there's there's activity, um, at least additive activity. But what we really need are randomized studies to show, is this getting us where we need to go in terms of survival? Because improving the response rate you know, it's just kind of juking the stats. Not so interested in that. We want people to live longer. And for that, we need randomized studies and longer follow-up. And I think I cannot agree more. Survival and quality of life, those should be the primary endpoints. And again, uh, phase three data with randomized study would definitely dictate that. And we'll, uh, we'll have to see where that takes us. While we are certainly used to this drug, cestuzumab, as you stressed with bladder and breast cancer. So as a generalist, I think one come about, it'll be easier to adapt when it comes in practice. Dr. Lou, you've covered a lot here, and we cannot thank you enough for discussing these studies. As always, stay tuned for a recap from this discussion. We have covered four studies with Dr. Lou post-World Conference on Lung Cancer. When it comes to non-small cell lung cancer, looking for actionable mutation is very critical. For patients with common EGFR mutation, osimertinib with chemotherapy might be the right option for a very small subset, maybe with intracranial disease or heavy tumor burden, whereas single-agent osimertinib for now remains the standard of care, unless we see a overall survival benefit with this combination approach. Treatment options in second line after osimertinib are in fact limited. There is more to come, but amivantamab does look like a promising option, which is already in fact approved for exon 20 EGFR mutation. And new agents targeting HER3 should be on your radar as well. Then with Dr. Lu, we also discussed MARS-2 study and systemic chemotherapy upfront seems to be the right approach even for resectable mesothelioma patients based on this data. And then, chemo plus IO remains the standard of care for low PDL1, whereas for high PDL1, we are seeing promising activity with sasetumzumab in combination with immunotherapy. Join us back for more practice changing coverage, the Oncology Brothers.